Hello everybody, I'm your host Andre Salazar and today on The Art of Comics we're going to talk about Mr. Miracle. Boom. Hey everybody, today we're talking about Mr. Miracle. Uh, every now and then here on The Art of Comics I'm going to talk about the new hotness. I'm going to talk about the stuff that everybody has been talking about and this was the hotness a year and a half ago or so. Eisner Award winner for Best Artist, Best Writer. When did this come out here? Bop, bop, bop. Yeah, so this was last year. So this is hot off the presses. I just finished reading this today. We're going to talk about it. Um, it's really good. I mean, it's really good. It's, it's <clears throat> worthy of the acclaim and of the, the, the scuttlebutt. It is... Um, damn good book and I want to talk about it for sure we're gonna break it down I think I, I feel like lately on the channel I've been doing a lot of talking about the art and the visuals and I haven't given the the plot the words the story the writers uh, enough time on the channel so I want to change that today and I'm going to be changing that in the future. So I really want to make sure I'm talking about both story and pictures, uh, about storytelling together and how the writer uh, is critical to it, not just focus on the visual art style, you know, the mechanics of images, right? So uh, this is actually a great book to do that because it's very well written as well as beautifully illustrated. And um, I'm not a huge, I don't have like a lot of Mitch's work. I don't have a lot of, Tom King's work, so I'm not like a huge fanboy about it. I just heard about this book. This was the book that people were talking about, so I had to get it. Um, I'm trying to think of where I got this. I think I got it at a convention. I might have even got it as far back as San Diego. I don't remember. Um, but it's been on my shelf. I've got like a shelf full of books that I have not read yet, and I got stacks of books I haven't even finished. So I got lots to read. But I was like, you know what, I'm going to take this and read this on the bus this week. And so it's been a pleasure. It's been a delight. So why don't we just go ahead and flip on down the camera and just take a look at DC Comics' Mr. Miracle because it's bad -ish. Let's do it. Okay, everybody. Let's dive into Mr. Miracle. And um, there's a lot to unpack here. It is a good book. It is. It's actually really good. And I, I've been thinking about it today. And... Um, um, there's a lot of really great storytelling techniques and things that are happening here that I think are worth mentioning and worth worth discussing. So uh, let's just get in on this, Mama. Um, this is a 12-part miniseries. And so when you're writing something like this, you know, uh, Tom has to come up with not only the over overarching kind of like story of the 12 issues what's happening how the characters are changing all that kind of stuff but also um each issue is kind of has its own story right so you have to look at it like these 12 stories as self-contained issues and then they all feed into this larger 12 part story uh and he does a brilliant job and I'll go through what I love about it. But um, this first, the first part of issue one is a great kind of primer. And Mitch uh, uses this kind of older style. It's told with this kind of old like, you know, um, Saturday morning cartoon or, you know, newsreel type of dialogue and a uh, little kitschiness to it. And it basically kind of goes through and gives us a background. So if you don't know anything about the new gods, about Dark Side, you know, about High Father, about all that kind of stuff, this breaks it down. So this kind of gives us a little, just a quick review of, you know, Mr. Miracle, Orion, brothers, switching, you know, where they were grown up. Mr. Miracle went to Apocalypse. You know, Orion went to High Father, you know, to kind of like settle the war, all this kind of stuff. 
Orion was loved, you know, by High Father, of course. Mr. Miracle was taken care of by Granny Goodness and tortured, you know, through the pits of an apocalypse. And so we get all that kind of background told in this really kind of fun retro way, and it works great. Um, and we've got the two by two by three kind of six panel format, and it's all, as you can see, kind of like a TV show, right? So it's all done like a, like a program uh, with this kind of narration, and it works great. And that's, you know, 14 pages, so half of the book. And then we pop into reality. Mitch has got a great style. Um, this stuff is really, really well rendered. He, he's using, he's going to use a lot of filters and screen tones and uh, effects and a lot of Photoshop stuff, but I think it works really cool. And um, definitely an artist to look out for and to kind of like learn some tricks and emulate. Mitch is in Phoenix, he lives with Phoenix. Um, I don't think I've, I might have met him at a con, I don't remember to be honest. Um, and then we, we start off here where he's in the bathroom bleeding. I did not pick up that he was committing suicide. I didn't get that, I just totally didn't get it until later on in the story. I'm like, oh crap, he was trying to kill himself. Mr. Miracle, the escape artist, was trying to escape, right? Escape the pains of, of life and stuff. And this is a lot of the, the treaties or the, the theme of this book is dealing with a upbringing that was very hard, very challenging, very difficult, and how to kind of overcome that, right? And how family is important. And in a way, this story, to be honest, you guys, it's, you know, as an older guy, you know, I'm in my 40s, I can relate to this, I have kids, so I get a lot of this. But if I was a 13 year old, I would not like this, I, could, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't like see the depth here. If I was a 10 year old or an eight year old, this is not for me, you know? Even if I was, you know, 17, 16, 17, it just is not for me. Um, so it has an audience. This the audience for this book is definitely mature, older people. You know, um, I know we make comics for kids. Still, it's not like all comics are like this. But it does make me just point out that this isn't just a you know title that you just pick up. You know, as a kid, it's different, and um, you know, it's got that kind of a mature theme which I think is great for me, I love it. But also there's a part of me that's like, oh man, kids wouldn't get this. And I hope that we are catering enough in our industry for the future. Because if all damn books are about this kind of stuff, then there is no future in comics, right? Okay, enough of that. Um, okay, have I told you guys how much I love the nine panel grid? I became a lover of the nine panel grid because of Watchmen and because of Keith Giffen when he worked on Justice League and, you know, Heckler and Ambush Bug and that kind of stuff. I love the nine panel grid. Three by three grid's great. I suck at it because of the dimension, because of the composition of the, of the panel. It's not landscape and you just have to think of things differently. I find it hard to work in, but man, I love it so much, and I want—I just need to do more of it. Anyway, we're going right into the story. He's at the hospital. Big Barda is there, um, and just look at some of the art. Just some of the very kind of loose, abstract, you know, work, expression stuff. Some really loose stuff here, but then he'll do a lot of like rendering things here too. Uh, some great filters and tones he's putting in. And, you know, all this stuff is great. I love the little screen tones here and the textures. Um, it's got a kind of uh, some action to it. It actually reminds me a little bit of uh, Alex Maleev, too. So a little bit of that kind of wheelhouse, maybe. Alex Maleev, that school. Uh, maybe Michael Lark, but not really. I would say Michael Lark's a little different than this. But anyway. Um, he's back from the hospital, you know, uh, and who shows up? 
his brother Orion. There's going to be a lot of boom tubing in this book. Orion comes, beats on him, tells him to kind of grow a pair, be a man, right? And of course, Barda is Barda is a great character in this story. She really is the big, you know, the big heavy. She's the mama bear. She's the big Barda that we love. He, you know, Tom does a great job of really characterizing these these characters. You know, in, in fact, I, I'll, but I will say though that like Mr. Miracle, you know, Scott Free is not. <clears throat> he's this wounded very introspective, very damaged, depressed guy. He's not the fun-loving Scott Free in JLI, right? From the 80s and 90s. That's this is not him. So he's definitely this is a grounded, very grounded story about with the human condition type of deal. Uh Big Barda though is just a great mama bear and I love her. So there's also these great moments, and, and we, we flash back to these these like uh, performances on TV and things like that that he does, and we kind of get a glimpse of his kind of uh, occupation as a performer and kind of entertainer, and that kind of stuff. Um, so we get little glimpses of that, and then the story uh, is kind of now laying on this this uh new genesis story where while he's in uh america or on earth rather there are these you know the war still going on between new genesis and apocalypse we also have these moments of dark side is these big black panels and they're put there specifically for certain moments for reasons it is this, you know, foreboding darkness, you know, that is in the story, that he is there, God is, you know, dark side is, it's like, this is real, he's ever present, you know, omniscient, omnipresent type of a character. So we feel that. It's also kind of maybe a look on his psyche and what he's thinking of and how it kind of traumatizes him being grown up in this hellscape of uh, apocalypse. So um, he's dealing with, you know, all those kind of problems. They decide to go to New Genesis. Uh, they're going to go as them together. And now we're in issue two. So um, this is just starting up the, the story of what's going on. And... Um, now this is Apocalypse and he uses this palette of, um, a lot of these violets and reds, all that kind of, that side of the color wheel for Apocalypse. And it works really well, of course. And there's also moments where I don't know what he's doing. I really wish I could figure it out. He's doing this kind of digitized, um, like radio frequency jamming visual, like a TV thing. I don't know what you call it. I don't know how he does it either. I really want to learn. I need, maybe if I just message him, I wonder if he'd, he'd break it down, but it's really cool effect. I'm assuming he's just warping it. Maybe he's getting all those layers, the colors and the inks. He, and then he, uh, in Photoshop just does a transformation and warps it. I'm assuming maybe I should just try that tonight and kind of see if that's what he's doing. But it looks really cool. And I actually dig it a lot. And he's going to do it a lot throughout this whole thing. I'm not sure why it's when it happens. So when it happens, there's probably a, a meaning behind it, but I'm not sure what it is. So now we have Scott. He's in Apocalypse. There's some battling. He's kind of like kicking some ass and taking showers here. Uh, with the wife, you know, trying to just survive this battle. They're in this war, you know, they're trying. It, it, it's also this, you know, difference between L.A., Los Angeles, Earth, and this other world that they grew up in. 
that maybe they don't remember all the technology or there's these memories of this other life. And so it's also this kind of element of, you know, um, living in two worlds, you know, and going back home, right? So here they're, they're here, uh, they're in, um, in New Genesis and they're in front of Orion, okay, who is now the, the high father because um, high father, his father died. And so now Orion's in charge and there's some issues with that because Orion's an ass. And so he's given him a mission. You need to go and you need to kill Granny Goodness the woman who raised you, right? Tortured you and raised you. So there is some kind of Stockholm Syndrome with Scott and Barda and her, where she raised them with hatred and evilness, but there's also some love that's kind of like intermixed in that. So that's kind of a, kind of an interesting element to, to this whole thing. They go, they go see uh, Granny Goodness, and, you know, I love these little moments like, oh, my babies, my babies come to granny, you know, and they go there, look at you. And there's these moments of tenderness that she has with them, um, which I think are interesting. And there's also, let me say this too about King. Um, there's a lot of comedy in here too. He, he really does a great job of putting these comedic elements. And a lot of it is just a moment of something we all deal with, right? Some kind of like a, a common situation that we all that we all kind of deal with and that's put in this crazy story of aliens and and superheroes and things like that so um sprinkling in comedy is an art it's hard it's a challenge and it works so well when you have a heavy story like suicide and and genocide things like that you got to sprinkle in those little comedic bits and it works really well. So they have this, so they have jello, right? So they gotta have jello. So there's these little things like, you know, they're in apocalypse eating jello with this, you know, slave guy. And she wants to eat some jello first before they talk. And of course she knows what they're gonna try to do. And uh, they're gonna try to kill her. And he, she goes, look, 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 don't do that. This was all a trick. I knew you were gonna try to kill me. Don't do it. They warned me ahead of time, I'm supposed to kill you. And Barda just does it. And Barda's like, Barda does not screw around. And Barda just bashes her in and kills Goody Grandness. So what's interesting about this book is people are dying. Now, I don't know the continuity of DC. I don't know if this sticks or not, but we're talking High Father dies, Granny Goodness dies, and a little bit Orion's gonna die. You know, people are dying. And uh, I find that interesting. So. They could get granted goodness, so mission accomplished. And at the end of each, at the end of each issue, we have these narration again, similar to the beginning of the intro with the uh, Kichi um, cartoon type of TV show. So it's got that, you know, you'll be mad about our new exploit if you swallow the paranoid pill. You know, it's got that kind of moment of, for Mr. Miracle, this could mean defeat and death. You know, that kind of little like narration to kind of like get us ready for the next. So it's almost as though this whole thing is a show. Maybe this is all kind of a dream of uh, in some way. And we'll get into that later on. Okay, again, Really interesting effects visually uh, that Mitch is using here. Super high, like um, saturated colors. And again, he's using these kind of distortions here. Like this is some kind of a transmission, you know, um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, and it gets really digitized and he, and he goes kind of goes pretty far doing it. But, um, we see Orion here, and Granny Goodness is gone. Now they're back here. Uh, we use, he's using all of these blue and cooler tones for nighttime, of course, which is common, and for Earth. He's gonna use tones, blues, 
uh, for night on Earth, and then he'll use some, a little bit warmer kind of uh, yellows and kind of off-whites and oranges for daytime. And again, great little comedy moments here with him and these other little characters from New Genesis and Apocalypse that come to visit him. Because of this boom tube, basically you constantly can have teleportation between these worlds. And so there's these, you know, dimensional, you know, interactions that happen that, that shouldn't. You know, we got this guy, um, Light something or other. I can't remember what his name is. Um, you know, he just kills this dude uh, and just... Yeah, Light Ray. It's just, oh, it's, it's good, man. It's uh, it's good stuff. So, I always like these panels where you just have like this little figure kind of going up. And, and we have this, not every issue, but a lot of the issues we have him doing a stunt of some sort. And again, playing into, he's the escape artist, right? He's trying to escape. He was trying to escape reality with the suicide. He's escaping that as part of his job. In fact, right after the job, now they're having lunch here on like Melrose or someplace down in LA. And so it's very modern. It's very kind of like, you know, um, just kind of a modern uh, take on stuff. You know, somebody wants to get a selfie with them, things like that. So that's kind of fun. Uh, oh, I said, did I say Wilshire? Did I say, uh, I might have said Melrose. Okay, and then this character is kind of funny. I don't know if Funky Flashman, I think Funky Flashman is real. I think that is a character in New Genesis. Um, I don't know if that was a, a Kirby character or what, but there's like a lot of weird stuff. He is kind of a funny guy. I do like Tom adding some humor with him a lot with, you know, saying a lot of Stan Lee-isms, you know, Excelsior, things like that. Kind of a little bit of a Marvel little bits here. That's that's really fun as a comic book reader and, and guy who knows some of the history of the story. So, um, you know, we're, not, we're having these conflict with Orion and Scott. And so, again, Scott is getting beat up. He is not showing that he cares, really, I don't think. He doesn't have the the strength to do what Orion would do, and um, we'll we'll see a little bit about that in, in the future. So the next issue, again, we're back home, uh, and then every now and then, you know, light wave where someone will show up, and I love Barda. Barda is a great character. He just slaps them, you know, just just bringing them down a peg, which is. Um, which is the comic relief part of it, right? Because before he was like a tough dude, he was like killing people. So it's just great to see, you know, we don't like him and so Bart is the one that's just gonna beat the, the crud out of him and, and we get some kind of, some joy out of that. So, you know, part of the writing is you gotta give the, the readers what they want at some point. You know, you got you can't just torture them constantly unless you're, you know, Carthy McCormick, and even then, I think you get something that you want at some point. So we want him to get beat down. Well, guess who's gonna do it? Big Barda, she's perfect for it. Again, like I was mentioning before, some kind of a escape. This must have been super fun to, to just do. I love this. I love the veggie platter. I mean, another again, another great gag that he puts in here, he gets a veggie platter because he's gonna have his brother and these officials from New Genesis come to the condo in you know, West Hollywood or whatever, right? It's just, it's just classic. These little moments here where they're sitting kind of scrunched up on the couch in this little trial, right? So they're doing this, this kind of a mock trial. Of course, Orion as the, as the god, he can, he's the judge, he's the jury, he's the executioner, right? So it's basically, Say what you're gonna say, I'ma kill you, right? Um, and then you know, shall we begin? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a carrot. And so it's just like, he gets the carrot. He walks over. You know, it's great. I'm gonna get a carrot. Walks over, dips it, bites it. Okay. And now, you know, the these little levity moments, 
really make this work because if it didn't have that, you guys, this would not work. This comic would be way too heavy. So it needs that. Remember how I was telling you about how this digitized and stuff? Really hardcore here. So some kind of signaling. Um, I might have to read this again and see if I can like pinpoint exactly what all that means. I think there's some more, more to it. This is all great too. Uh, them kind of going back and forth, battling it out, you know, verbally. <clears throat> and this would be nice too for Mitch because the drawing assignment for some of these pages would be actually pretty minimal once you do one or two of these panels with a couple of modifications you really can just bang out a page really quick and I'm all about that so whenever I see these kind of things I think oh cool he was able to do maybe two pages that day or something or maybe maybe even three so that is the benefit of the nine panel grid you can do things like that where you can uh, repeat for comedic value or for time lapse all that kind of stuff to kind of help your storytelling Um, and now we go into the next issue. Here they are, you know, doing the, uh, the hands on the Grom's Chinese theater down in Hollywood. So we do a lot of juxtaposition between modern, you know, current society in America versus the other world. Um, Here, they know that Scott's gonna die. He's been given a death sentence by Orion. He's got like a day or two to live. So they're gonna like live it up, right? So they're living it up. You know, they're gonna have one last romp, you know, and kind of like have their time together as a couple and kind of see all these, these people do everything he can before He's running out. He's dying, right? And this, I, look, I like this too. This is all these filters. Um, it's good stuff. And the good, good lettering here too, as well. This is a good page actually to kind of study like what is he using? What kind of um, Photoshop little tricks and, and gradations he's doing to kind of like give it this, this little texture. So it's good stuff. So, and also, it's kind of fun because if you look through the book, he's always wearing a DC hero t shirt out of a character. There's a Flash, there's a Superman, there's a Batman, there's different characters, which is kind of fun. Um, so, after their day, their like last day on Earth, basically, last day together, they enjoy it. There's a lot of conversations here about, about everything. And uh, that's great, too. This is, this is really, really cool. This is like maybe one of my favorite stuff here. Yeah, really, really great. I mean, this is, it's pretty freaking top notch. Again, last night. Uh, and then now it's uh, Funky, Funky Man's here. Funky Flash Man is here. They're getting ready. They're gonna go, it's time to Go see Orion, meet his maker. But guess what? Big Barda says, you know what? We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna go to our death. We're gonna fight our way out and we're gonna stay. And so that's how that goes. And it's it's really evocative, all the blood and stuff. It kind of works, works really cool. These are kind of neat little abstract images. And I'm not really sure if they have necessarily a meeting, I think they just look really cool. Again, going back to that digitized kind of feeling. Okay. Um, they're getting prepped. They're getting ready. Now they're going to go to Genesis and start kicking some, some butt. So th this is great. These are kind of just fun. They go in. They're kinda, it's almost like a heist. They kind of break in. They go different places. There's these different traps. We kind of see Scott's ability to be this master of traps and escaping different dangers and leviathans in the swamp and the freaking guards and there's little c 
comedic little moments with the guards, you know, talking about break or coffee or whatever, and they're killing them, and and just, and these great little fighting sequences and great timing, great positioning, choreography of the battles. Uh, it just works really good. Um, this is this was a lot of fun to read. This whole this whole little section of getting through, you know, and they're talking about while they're doing this, and this is another great storytelling thing. While they're doing this very serious battle, they're bantering about how to decorate the condo, right? Oh, I wanted, you know, a bed against the, the window because it gets cold, or, you know. So they're talking about all these different things about downsizing or maybe they get a smaller place because they don't have so much stuff and everything. And that really works really well. And you see that a lot in modern pop uh, entertainment media. You see that a lot where something serious is going down, but they're kibitzing about something kind of silly and mundane. Um, but it works, it, it works, and so it's a good trick, and Tom uses it well, and the conversations feel very natural, very real, right, to what we would consider real. Okay, get through all this, again, this goes, this might be the whole issue, actually, of them just, like, getting to Orion. Flip over back here, now, um, she is pregnant. And we're going to have a baby. And this is a great eight pages or so of her, you know, going through labor, having the baby, um, having been there um, a couple times, seeing this. It was pretty cool. It was just, it feels real. It feels just right. So this is a great scene. And it's great art here. Um, just illustrating this very culminating, exciting uh, and terrifying moment of giving birth. So, great, great um, emotion and stuff like that. So, I dug this a lot. And the baby comes out, and the baby's okay. And he's got this knife that is made out of a, <clears throat> somehow it's made out of Orion, Orion's body or soul or something. And because of that, because it's made out of a god, it can cut through the baby, the, the umbilical cord. And there you go. And then again, we have that kind of commentary, the TV show commentary. Okay, now we're back. Now it's gonna be dad life. We're, we're now we're doing like modern dad life with the newborn, with the funky, you know, guy who's the nanny with war, right? Because now Scott is the High Father. Now that High Father's dead, Orion's dead, and now he is the leader of New Genesis. And they're in the middle of a war with New Genesis and Apocalypse, right? Who? Dark segments. So we have this back and forth, the war, the battle, with, again, we have Big Barda on Earth talking to him while he's in the middle of this war in Apocalypse. And so, and then vice versa, he'll be on Earth and she'll be fighting in Apocalypse and they'll be having these conversations. And the conversations are always, again, these mundane things about, now it's about the baby, right? Like what the baby eat, what the baby poop, when's the baby sleeping, all that kind of jazz. Then there's a joke here about Batman and Batman kills babies because you know, you're not supposed to put toys in with the baby's crib because uh, of SARS and things like that. So, uh, there's all, so again, we have all these little like just, uh, not juxtaposition, but just um, parallel stories, right? Going back and forth. Uh, works. It works, dude. But see, again, if I was a 10 year old, none of that would work for me. You know, that's just not the audience. That's okay. Comics don't have to be for everybody. But this comic definitely is for. Um, the older crowd. Interesting moment here where now we have one of these like monster demons, parallax demons, or whatever they're called, you know, but there's like a baby one. And he's like, dude, I got a baby. And there's like a little bit of like conflict there about maybe that deserves to live too, right? It's like, I have a child. So we've got a little bit of that kind of conflict going. And really it's a, this 
level of exhaustion of living two worlds, two lives. Life at home, raising a family, life at work. But what if your work was you're a god and you're doing this planetary, you know, war? How would you be able to juggle those responsibilities? That's that's the premise of the second half of the story. And we have his his I guess brother, I don't know if it would be his brother or not, but Calabac, what's his name? I think it's called Calabac. Um who's now kind of in charge. He's like the voice of Dark Side. And so they're negotiating. Now it's negotiating peace and they're trying to figure out the negotiations. Uh, this is a great, another comedic moment. You know, they're waiting for him. He's getting something out. What's going on? He's getting this little device. Okay, I'm waiting. I'm ticked off. He pulls it out. They're like glasses. He puts on the glasses. I mean, that's just a great comedic bit. Uh, yeah, it took a whole page, but you got 12 issues, so do it, dude. <laughs> yeah, it works really good. I dig this stuff. This is a lot of fun, and they're like just talking about the legalism and that kind of elements of of how to negotiate war treaties and, and, and release of prisoners and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty fun. Um, he gives them this mirror which kind of shows them their true self or their in, inner world and you really feel for them as you kind of see that inside they're just they've been burned alive and you know it's pretty sad stuff at least that's the way it is now it will not always be that way um now it's time to Oh, is this is this where? Uh, yeah, this is interesting. Dark said this is all. Dark said is willing to withdraw all forces immediately, return all prisoners. Further, he would disarm and allow a new Genesis force to inspect Apocalypse. Finally, he would surrender the anti-life equation. What? That's you said. That was even on the table. In return for this thing, complete capitulation. Dark said humbly asks for one thing. He asked for the custody of his only grandchild, Jacob Free. Boom. You can end the war. Millions won't die. You get the anti-life equation. Dark side can never do anything bad. Everybody is, you save everything. The cost is your child. The cost is your boy. Your boy's not going to die. He's just going to be raised by the devil in apocalypse in the same manner in which you were raised and you were traumatized and you are the broken man you are because of it. So if you are willing to let your son go through the hell that you went through and you came out okay, of course, is that worth the price of a war, right? That's, now of course, Bart is like, hell no, but he's got to decide what is he going to do? And that's what the last couple issues are about, is deciding, is it worth it? And I love this little scene with Booster and uh, Blue Beetle. Is it worth it to do that? Barta won't have it. Barta's not even going to, you know, humor the discussion. It is off the table. There is no talking about that as an option. But Scott has to think about, is it worth it? And he even talks to some people like at a grocery store or whatever. Is it worth it? to sacrifice your kid in that way. Basically have your kid raised by people who raised you to save the world. Uh, this is a great little scene. Again, a lot of comedy, you know, the the store clerk at the grocery store trying to get him to get a rewards card and he talks about saving his, his uh, saving the world for the kid and it's good stuff. A lot of heart to heart felt discussions here between the two talking about what to do. And he's saying, hey, I got through it. And she's like, no, we didn't get through it. You tried to kill yourself. And I've been here trying to keep it all together. So it's a great, this was a great scene. This is really good. This is probably one of the more emotional, like climactic moments of the couple. Because now we see, we go back to the suicide in the very beginning. And we say, look, Martha, uh, Bartha, She's been the one that's been holding it together. He was the one that was trying to escape. He was the one that was trying to give up. She kept it together. 
So if you think you made it out, you really didn't. And I don't want my kid to have to go through such a life in which he would want to kill himself, right? That's her message. Can't argue with it. Uh, they're doing a birthday party for the kid. So again, we go from this very serious moment to now some levity. Just switch it over. Um, and then now some kind of a heartfelt moment where he's talking about, okay, I'm going to trick Dark Side. And she's like, okay, cool. We'll trick him. We'll see if this pulls us off, right? And uh, they have the party. Yeah, now they come. Now they're going to deliver the boy. Deliver Jacob free, their kid, to Dark Side. Again, have a great moment of the veggie platter. He's there. He's willing to do it. They're like, you're going to trick us. We're like, no, we won't. We're good. We're going to give you the kid. You can trust us. He's like, okay, I'm going to give you my eyeball. Dark Side gives him the eye, which is basically his power. He can no longer do the Omega Effect, anti-life equation, all that kind of stuff. You now have that. Bart is like, okay, smashes it. Now you're one-eyed Jack. Uh, here's the baby. And wah, 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 it's a trick. The stroller is like this megaton beam thing that is badass and jacks up dark side unfortunately not enough not what they thought and so dark side just starts beating the hell out of them and there's some crying but then he goes down because he had that dagger. Remember that dagger from Orion that he cut the umbilical cord? He had that dagger, which was made from Orion, and there was a prophecy that Orion would be the only one that could kill him. Well, guess what? He did in the form of a knife. Then we find out it was Metron was Desaad, and I'm not so sure why that was a trick, but it was, and so it's like, I like them apples. Again, going back to the that that kind of uh, his little performances. And now, th now this is kind of the last issue and this is the epilogue. This is them, we're kind of back on track. He's gonna shave, we're gonna go back to, back to one, back to zero, so to speak. First position, as they say in film. And uh, now in the mirror, that mirror that showed them all gnarly, now we see that uh, they're kind of happy. And they look good. And <laughs> they had this battle. It's funny. Um, Bart is just a bad mofo. Then we find out, guess what? Bart is going to have a girl. So we've got the ultrasound. Bart is going to have another kid. And they're kind of happy-go-lucky. He's had, He has these little, like, visions or memories of High Father, and he kind of um, relinquishes himself of all that kind of emotion. You know, he's like, screw this, big nose. Um, we see Oberon, you know, the death of Oberon. He kind of like talks a little bit about the, you know, with the, in his memory of that. And uh, they're kind of together, and this is, this is them. And it's good, man. It's really good. It's, I think the art was incredible. I think the story is really good. Each, each issue, you know, has this kind of moment and it builds, you know. Uh, I didn't know where it was going. I knew nothing about this. So it was really cool to see where it was going. I didn't know there was gonna be kids involved and a family and all that kind of stuff. But it really is the human condition from a guy with this like PS PTSD kind of thing. And uh, I, think it, I think it's really, really well done. Definitely mature in theme, you know? That's what I'm talking about, in theme. And um, grounded in a lot, of, a lot of modern sensibility in modern moments. Which I think is good. I do wonder if it will 
um, have the longevity because there is a tendency if it's so like modern and and topical or, or up to date that that might be it might date it in some way I don't know if it will but I could see it doing that potentially I could also see maybe if you didn't live in LA not that he does but you know there might be some like some feeling of that it's a little too like cool for school or local thing I don't know I'm kind of just shoot spitballing on that one but um great stuff great rendering great color choices the art is wonderful I love the nine panel grid uh I love the, the comedy in it and uh that's Miracle Man so if you like this kind of stuff let me know comment below let me know what you guys think of this um this episode and kind of doing really deep dive into that I mean I went we went through the whole freaking thing and let me know what you think um subscribe and all that stuff and if you want to see my stuff go check out my patreon so thanks guys have a good one bye